Okay, there we go. So uh, we are part, we are still on part, two, uh, introduction part two. We are on page two. And we've been talking about the distinction between law and gospel. And we just talked about the distinction between passive righteousness and active righteousness. Now they're, um, they're uh, uh, very similar, at least they're very related. But they, they kind of answer different questions. Law and gospel answer the question, what are the two main doctrines, the two main teachings of the Bible? How does God speak? And so we teach law and gospel. We talked about law as everything that God expects us to do, and gospel is everything that God has done for us. Passive righteousness and active righteousness is answers the question, how is it that we are considered right before God? How is it that we have righteousness before God? And, and what kind of righteousness is that? And so that's where it's helpful to talk about the distinction between the righteousness of the law, active righteousness, and the righteousness of faith, which is passive righteousness. And so uh, we talked about two analogies that might be helpful here, and, and I'll just review those quickly. Um, active, or excuse me, passive righteousness is like the uh, sky producing rain, right? The earth needs rain to, to grow plants and vegetations and be fruitful, but, but it can't do that unless it first receives rain, receives what it needs from the heavens. And so that's like our passive righteousness. We can't do anything until we first receive from God. But once being watered and, and healthy and sunshine and all that, uh, then the earth is able to bring forth fruit in vegetation and whatnot. And so that would be like the act of righteousness. Or another way to think about it would be, again, with the baseball mitt analogy. Uh, so we are just standing there. We, we can't do anything. You know, you can't throw the, second, the, the player out at second. Uh, if you don't have the ball. So you're just standing there. And, and one person said, you know, without God, we don't even have a glove. So he, he gives us the glove to first receive the ball. And then he's the one who, who gives us the ball in the first place. That's like passive righteousness. You can only stand there. But once you do have the ball, once you have been gifted everything you need from God, then you are able to make the play at second or first or wherever the play may be. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the act of righteousness. So again, act of righteousness is what I must perform. It's commanded by God. So we hear what we are to do in God's law. My old sinful nature especially needs to hear it. My old sinful nature wants to rebel against God, wants to do the opposite of God. The Bible says we were enemies of God in our sin before he intervened in our lives. And my act of righteousness is what gives me a clear conscience before my neighbor. So I think, how is it that I'm supposed to love and serve my neighbor, which is all of you and everyone that God puts in my life. And so my act of righteousness are the things that I do to have a clear conscience before each of you. And likewise, you in front of your neighbors. Your act of righteousness is what you do to love and serve them. Passive righteousness, again, like we've talked about, is what God has done for me. It's what we could not achieve on our own. We simply receive it from Christ. God offers it in Christ. In church today, we hear John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, you had nothing to do with Jesus coming to save you. In fact, 1 Corinthians says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it wasn't when we got our act together. It wasn't when we have, you know, in, in reality, I probably should have switched these two to, to highlight the fact that passive righteousness comes first. So before we had anything that we could do to please God, God saved us through Christ. And this applies to my new nature in Christ. It's what gives me the new nature. We each have, have, have begun to be a new creation in Christ. And, and that new creation is, is motivated then to do active righteousness types things, but we aren't saved because we do works of the law. We are saved because uh, of Jesus and what he did. And this passive righteousness is what gives me a clear conscience before God. So when I think, how do I have righteousness before God? How do I have good standing before God? I don't look to what I do. I look to what Jesus has done for me. And, and that is the good news of the gospel. So that's just, a, a, again, a real brief review of, of passive and active righteousness, which we talked about last week. But any questions or comments on that?
All right, I um, mentioned to you that I would be occasionally bringing things in from Luther's commentary on Galatians, which uh, many people uh, consider to be the foremost commentary on Galatians. Luther uh, writing to the Galatians, uh, or <laughs> Luther commenting on Paul's writing to the Galatians. And so I just had to share this, this um, a larger quote uh, from, from that introduction to that work. And here, Luther is talking about the limits of the law. So you think, what is the purpose of God's law? God's law is meant to, again, that second use of the law, show us our sin, show us where we fall short, show us where we don't have the righteousness in and of ourselves to earn our own salvation. That law is meant to accuse us and demonstrate to us without a shadow of a doubt that we are condemned in our sin and we can't save ourselves. But once the law has done its work, that is its limit. It can't go any further or it shouldn't go any further. And that's where the gospel takes over. We realize that we are lost and condemned sinners and need forgiveness. And so then the gospel comes in at that point and says, here is Christ for you, giving you your passive righteousness, the righteousness of faith, righteousness that he earned because we couldn't, so that now you do have right standing before God. And, and so the limit of the law is where the gospel then takes over. Now, if you think about it, again, we'll read this paragraph in just a moment, but just another note, the devil loves to confuse us in this matter. The devil loves to say, as you're contemplating your sin, loves to substitute gospel where law should be. Remember, law is not bad. Law is good. We need the law to accuse and reveal to us our sins. But the gospel, uh, the devil will use the gospel at that moment when it should be the law that we're hearing, when we should be able to see that we are forgiven sinners, and the devil will say, oh, don't worry about that sin. You don't need to repent of that. Oh, that's not a sin. Jesus forgives you. You don't need to worry about doing right or wrong. You're forgiven. And so you see, we neglect the law where we should pay attention to the law. And so the devil will use that moment uh, of confusion where we need the law and instead bring us gospel. And vice versa, when we then need to hear the gospel, when we are condemned, when we are guilty of our sins, when I, I, when I am in despair wondering how could God ever love me after what I have done, that's when the gospel will say, well, here's a moment for the gospel, so I'm instead going to bring the law. And he'll, he'll extend the limit of the law where the law shouldn't be, someone who is already convicted of their sins, and say, look at God's law of perfection. How dare you be like this? God could never love you. You are a sinner. And see, the, gospel, see, the, the law and its gospel always needs to be rightly distinguished, and the devil's primary tactic is to confuse those two. So the, um, the, the devil will preach instead gospel to an unrepentant sinner, and he will preach law to a troubled sinner. Do you remember that chart on the first page? We had who, who the law and gospel should apply to. The law should apply to the unrepentant sinner, and the gospel should apply to the troubled sinner, and the devil will flip those. So when we as Christians recognize this, well, we can spot then the devil's tactics a mile away. And I promise I, well, maybe I won't promise this. Uh, I might keep making connections to our Life Together study with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but that's one of the reasons why Dietrich Bonhoeffer says we need to be in community is because sometimes when we're on our own and we isolate ourselves, the devil gets us right where he wants us, and we have nothing, no voice from outside of ourselves to tell us the truth because sometimes we don't get the truth right. We're the easiest ones to deceive ourselves, and the devil can work on us over time then. But when we have a community of believers, and when we can hear the public proclamation of the forgiveness of sins in a church service, and when I have a brother or sister in Christ that I can turn to and say, I'm feeling really guilty about my sins, you know, then we have this support system that can rightly distinguish law and gospel for us. So anyway, that's, um, that's that. But let's look at this quote from Luther about limits of the law. 
He says, in a Christian, the law must not exceed its limits, but should have its dominion only over the flesh, which is subjected to it and remains under it. By the way, we'll talk more about this in just a moment when we read Romans 7. But when we hear the word flesh, we shouldn't think uh, physical body. We should think sinful nature. Okay, so when you hear the word flesh, think sinful nature. And we'll talk more about why that distinction is important in just a moment. All right, so the law should have dominion over the flesh. When this is the case, the law remain within its limits. But if it wants to ascend into the conscience and exert its rule there, give no more to the law than it has coming. So in other words, he's saying, if the law is ever coming into your conscience and convincing you that God could never forgive you, this is what you say to it. This is, uh, this is really good. This is what Luther says. Law, you want to ascend into the realm of conscience and rule there. You want to denounce its sin and take away the joy of my heart, which I have through faith in Christ. You want to plunge me into despair in order that I may perish. You are exceeding your jurisdiction. Stay within your limits and exercise your dominion over the flesh. You shall not touch my conscience, for I am baptized. And through the gospel, I have been called to a fellowship of righteousness and eternal life, to the kingdom of Christ in which my conscience is at peace, where there is no law, but only the forgiveness of sins, peace, quiet, happiness, salvation, and eternal life. Do not disturb me in these matters. In my conscience, not the law will reign, that hard tyrant and cruel disciplinarian, but Christ, the Son of God, the King of peace and righteousness, the sweet Savior and mediator. He will preserve my conscience happy and peaceful in the sound and pure doctrine of the gospel and in the knowledge of passive righteousness. Pretty powerful, isn't it? So Luther isn't saying the law has nothing to do with us. No, the law does have something to do with us where we see our sin and our sinful nature still wanting to burst its limits and, and exercise control in our lives. That will still happen this side of heaven. But when it comes to our clear conscience that we have on account of the gospel through Christ, and the law wants to enter that realm and say, well, either one, you need to do something to earn God's forgiveness, or two, how could God ever forgive you, you filthy sinner? You just call up this quote and say, uh-uh, not having it. How dare you take my joy away? Luther was a pretty uh, masterful writer and rhetorician, so I just had to share that with you. What do you think? What are your thoughts? Good? All right. So this might help then continue the conversation. We are going to look at uh, Romans, Romans chapter seven. So let's go there together. Now, uh, Mike made the... Uh, brilliant comment that you really do need to understand Romans in order to get Galatians. And I think that's true. So we're going to do a little studying of Romans uh, in our final introductory piece here, uh, uh, almost final introductory piece, before we get to Galatians. So we're going to go to Romans 7. And uh, we have some uh, readers lined up, I believe. We're going to take this in just little parts. So is it the first Six verses. six verses. Okay, let's look at the first six verses of Romans 7. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man, while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. 
So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to one another, to him who raised him from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, so that we bore fr fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Okay, so let's just take that for a moment. So Paul is using an analogy of marriage, right? If someone is in marriage, they are bound to their spouse. If that spouse die, they are no longer bound in that marriage. They can marry someone else. If they marry someone before that marriage covenant is complete, then obviously that's what we call adultery. Um, but uh, he's comparing that to then to our old sinful nature and how we are captive to sin because of the sin inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve, and we all have this sinful nature. Now, again, I'm going to try hard not to turn a study on Galatians into a study on Romans, but if you look at the previous chapter in Romans 6, that's that famous passage, do you not know that all those who have been baptized into Christ have been crucified with him? You have died in your baptism, and you have been raised to the newness of life. Well, what is it exactly that died in baptism? It's our old sinful nature. And you go, wait a minute, but I still sin in this world. Well, and that's where we get into this distinction we're talking about. Yes, our old sinful nature died to Christ. That is, we have been released from the power of death and we have been given new life in Christ and our salvation is secure. On this side of heaven, however, we will still have this battle between our old sinful self, what Paul here calls the flesh. I'm not sure the, what the word was used in your translation, Mark, but in verse five, it brings up the word flesh. Um, and this life that we have in the spirit. And so there's this battle going on in this life between the spirit in us and what he inspires us to do, the good works, and our old sinful nature, which wants us, of course, to sin. And so um, that, uh, that is what he's comparing to this marriage example. Uh, we are set free from the law, uh, but insofar as we still have the sinful nature rear its ugly head in this life, that's when we do still need to hear the law. But let's keep on moving here. The next section is 7 through 12. Okay, thank you. So let's read that next, please. What then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the, an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. Okay, thank you. So remember, people sort of get this distinction between law and gospel and think, okay, law, bad, gospel, good. No, no. Paul is very clear. The, the law is God's holy will for our lives. It can't help be good. We, we, of course, wouldn't say that God's will for our lives is not good. And that's what the law is. He says, then what shall we say? Verse 7, the law is sin by no means. And then verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law is good. The problem is we are sinful. And Paul is saying, if it hadn't been for the law, I would never have known that I was a sinner. This, you hear the second use of the law coming in? That's why we went through this. When we hear the law, we realize what the sin is that we did. So you shall not covet. I realize I do covet. So the law has now reflected to me my sin. And in verse 9, uh, Paul says, I was once alive apart from the law. People say, oh, you see, Paul, before he had the law, had the ability to be righteous before God. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I was living before I knew the law, and but I was ignorant of my sin. He said, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. He realized that when uh, we realize, when we hear God's 
a good and righteous will, before that, we think we're perfect, we're good, we're doing all right. People say, well, I'm a good person. But once we hear how exacting God's holy and perfect will is, we realize there's no way I could live up to that. And that's the truth, that all fall short of the glory of God, as Paul says elsewhere in this book. Uh, so he thought, and then he also takes aim at the people who think that you can keep the commandment in order to earn your salvation. Verse 10, the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. So those who think they were keeping God's law to be saved, he goes, no, no. Once you realize how exacting the law is, it can't help but prove to be death to you. But again, do not misunderstand. It doesn't mean the law is bad. It means that we have a sinful nature that kills us. Any questions before we keep reading on? All right, next section. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment... Uh -oh. I lost it. Sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do want to do, what, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Okay, thank you. And so we have this distinction between flesh and spirit, and I want to make sure that you see that it's in verse 14. Uh, I think your translation said unspiritual, but the word is flesh. Uh, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. And again, the verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Now, here's an important distinction that we need to make, and some of you will nod your heads because I know that I've had this conversation with you, uh, and uh, the distinction is that the flesh-spirit distinction that Paul's talking about is not the same as the body-soul distinction, and here's why that's important. Flesh, according to the Bible, according to Romans 7, is what is sinful within me. And the spirit, and I have a spirit, and it is a spirit renewed by the Holy Spirit, and that also is within me. And so in my life, you can hear the struggle that the Apostle Paul has between the flesh and the spirit. And that should bring us a lot of great comfort, because he realized he was battling that on a daily basis, and we do too, don't we? we? We dare not deny it. But why I'm saying it's important to make sure that we don't see the flesh-spirit distinction as the same as the body-soul distinction, so we know that we as human beings are both body and soul, right? If we correlate those two and say that the flesh equals the body and the spirit equals the soul, now we're saying that the our body is the thing that should be rebelled against and needs to be put down, is somehow not the person God wants me to be, but my soul is the person that God wants me to be. And I heard someone say it over here, that's the ancient heresy of Gnosticism, <laughs> which is, by the way, before you think it's long gone, this is running rampant in our society today. It is the belief that what your inner being, whether you call it a soul or spirit or just my inner self, is somehow at odds and not the same as my exterior physical body. Taken to its 
extreme end, this is how you get transgenderism. So if, uh, if, the, um, if we're saying that somehow our body is, is contrary to God and unredeemable by God and the life that God wants us to be is our soul and soul only, and we conflate that with the distinction Paul's making between the flesh and the spirit, then we'll say, well, my body doesn't matter. My body is just a vessel for me to be in, in this life, until the time that God brings me to who I really am, which is uh, just my soul. And that's not what Jesus came to redeem. Jesus came to redeem us in both body and soul. Jesus was raised in both body and soul. Jesus is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father in both body and soul. And when he comes again, our bodies will be redeemed in both body and soul. It's only death that unnaturally separates our body and soul. But Jesus comes back and he will restore the two of them. So we need to make sure that as Christians, we believe that we are always meant to be both body and soul. And when we're talking about flesh and spirit, we're not saying that I somehow need to leave my body behind in order to get to the spiritual life that God actually wants for me. No, when, when Paul is talking about the flesh, he's talking about that which corrupts both body and soul. So the flesh is not the same as the body. The flesh is our sinful nature within us that brings death to both body and brings death to our soul. Without Jesus, our soul and body would spend an eternity in hell. But because of the work of the Holy Spirit, both our body and soul are redeemed, and we are in Christ. So Gnosticism believed that we're just sort of trudging along in this material world, which is sinful and can't help but be eternally sinful. And our goal is to just reach some kind of spiritual plane in existence. And that is what is holy and good. But that's contrary to the Christian story. The Christian story is Jesus is coming back to redeem all of creation and us in both body and soul. And so to make clear my point earlier of how this is running rampant in our society, it's not a Christian rampant, running rampant. It's, it's sort of a secular Gnosticism, um, which is that I would say so many people in our world today believe that our body is somehow less than my inner self that needs the true expression. And so they are living constantly at war with the body that God has given them. And by the way, our reaction should be empathy and sympathy, and to love them and care for them, and to eventually have relationship with them, to share with them that God has made them on purpose, and that he loves them the way that they are, because he has given them Jesus to forgive their sins. But, but you look around the world, and this is sort of just now the assumed uh, credo, which is, oh, you can be whoever you want to be. That's okay, because who you are externally is not who you are internally. And, and that's why I say we, we, can't make this to, we can't make the correlation between flesh and body and soul and spirit. When Paul's talking about flesh, he's talking about um, the corruption of us in both body and soul, and both our body and soul needs redemption in Jesus Christ. And that's the good news that we can bring to a world. We can say, no, God created you on purpose the way you are and loves you the way you are, and we all struggle. Look, listen to Paul's struggle in Romans 7 about how he is constantly wanting the thing that he should not want and not wanting the thing that he should do. And yet he recognizes that, that when, we have, when, we rec when we see this, we can say, no, there is good that I want to do, and that good comes from the Spirit. And that instructs my life in both body and soul, not just one or the other. So yes, Julie. This may not make any sense, but so what you're saying is that's why we're bodily raised when Jesus comes back, because our body's important too. It's an imperishable body, but is that why the body is raised to go with the spirit? That's exactly right. So we are designed to be uh, eternal in both body and spirit. 
And so Paul says, what was sown perishable will be raised imperishable. Being raised and so it's like tied in, like you said, it's not separated from. Right. So death unnaturally separates our body and soul for a time, mm -hmm. but that's not eternal. When Jesus comes back, we will be raised in both body and soul and perfectly redeemed. Becky. Um, what do you know about the background of the word flesh? Like why would translators use that English word? Is there any deeper meaning to that? Because it sure makes it sound like the same thing as body, right? Uh, yeah, so um, here's where it, it, it can be confusing, and that's why we need to be careful. Uh, the word in Greek is sarx, which is, um, you know, like where you get like sarcophagus and things like that, having to do with the body. It, 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 um, uh, and what can be confusing is that at some times when the Bible uses, uses the word flesh, uh, it does mean our physical bodies. Uh, so you can't always see the word flesh and say, um, oh, I know what that means. You have to look at the context, which is why we're reading this in context and say, what's being talked about here? Is this referring to my physical body or is this referring to this distinction between that which is sinful and that which is of the Holy Spirit? And I think it's fairly clear in Romans 7 uh, that, you, that Paul is talking about the distinction between that which is sinful in us and that which is of the Holy Spirit. So you just have to pay attention. But yeah, good question. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mike, you wanted to say something? So um, when I've studied this before, I always was taught that the sinful nature, the definition of the sinful nature is the human nature unaided by God, which they talk about when you get to Galatians 5, the difference between the acts of the sinful nature and the spirit. Having said that, going through all this that you're going through, it really links back to Galatians, because we know in Galatians, Paul is talking about the freedom we have in Christ, which is, you don't really understand what that freedom is to understand the length he goes to, to talk about the law and the spirit and you yep. get that all figured out then you go back to galatians and have him talk about christian liberty and then it all begins to make sense yes yeah so you're you're doing a great job anticipating the connections we are going to be made and i know you've taught galatians before so i know a lot of your background comes from that and so you you see where i'm going and 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 all of us will too once we get there so thank you mike i appreciate that willard Oh, doing the next reading. Okay, I thought you were ahead. Any other questions? Okay. All right, go ahead, Willard, please do. Verse 21. Verse 21. So I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Okay. So again, we, we know that he's not talking about body versus uh, soul because, you know, are any of us called to only serve God with our souls and not our bodies? No, it's precisely in our bodies that we are obviously serving others. So the distinction he's making is that I am in sin when I am considering my, my sinful nature, my flesh. It can't help but sin in both thought, word, and deed. Jesus made that very clear when he came uh, to, um, uh, to the Pharisees. And he said, you have heard that it was said, you know, you shall not commit adultery. But what I tell you is that anyone who has looked at a woman lustfully has committed adultery. He, he deepened the, the understanding of the law, which was that um, you, you thought it was just outward physical actions. No, no. It's of uh, sin influence us in mind, heart, 
uh, soul and the works of our body. So Paul's very clear here. He is saying, we are sinful through and through, but now that I do have the Holy Spirit working in me, a new creation within me that Christ has put my sinful nature to death, and that I am now able to want to do the things that I should want, when my spirit aligns with the law of God, that's a good thing. But in this life, we, it goes back and forth, and we struggle. Julie. This is so vague, I don't know if I can come, to come up with So is this also why they call our body our temple that Christ dwells in? Our bodies are temple or our tent that our soul lives in. So that's why they refer to the body as the temple. I'm so glad you brought that up, Julie. Here's another great anti-Gnostic uh, argument, uh, which is that um, why would the Holy Spirit want to take residence because you're right, the Bible calls our body a temple. Why would the Holy Spirit want to take residence in something that is ultimately unredeemable, which is our body? And the point is, because he intends to redeem our body as well. Our body is not evil and bad, and, and we're just trying to escape it at the end of our life. No, this is what the Holy Spirit is beginning to redeem even today, that within us, we have the Holy Spirit who is letting us know here is the good and gracious will of God. So great point. Any other comments or questions on that? This is a big topic. Yeah, Bruce. Is, is this maybe Paul's way of uh, making us understand also that uh, get used to it, folks, spiritual warfare is going to be an ongoing thing. Yeah. And you've got to, you're going to have to come to grips with it yeah. and rely on the Holy Spirit to guide you properly because Satan's going to be coming after you until the day you leave this earth. Right. And we're, we'll talk more about it in the very last section on the page, which is anthropology, but it helps answer. I think what Paul is doing is bringing us a lot of comfort, a lot of foreknowledge. And, and the question so many Christians have asked, which is, if I'm a Christian, why do I keep sinning? Does that mean I'm not saved? Does that mean it didn't work? Does that mean that Jesus doesn't love me? You know, that's what he's answering. And, and again, we'll talk more about that here in just a second. But you're right. He's, he's bracing us for what life in this world looks like. So let's move to that now. So this anthropology, anthropology means, of course, the, the study of, of humans, uh, of mankind. But in a theological sense, anthropology means what is the status of our will, of our human capabilities? And our Lutheran confessions, um, again, the Lutheran confessions is the, the book, the collection of documents from the 1500s, which lay out, here's what we believe scripture teaches and confesses. And we are a confessional Lutheran church, which means we adhere to those confessions. We say, yes, that is what we believe and teach. And it's not changing. So in the, specifically in the formula of Concord, which is one of those documents contained within our Lutheran confessions, article two is all about free will. And it delineates, which I think is really helpful, four states that we've historically experienced or will experience of the human will. In other words, what are we capable of on our own? And the four different states were before the fall, Adam and Eve, after the fall, mankind, after baptism, and after the resurrection, which hasn't happened yet. And it, I think this is, this is helpful to go through. So before the fall, Adam and Eve were able to sin, as demonstrated in Genesis chapter 3, right? They were able to sin, but they were also able not to sin. And so God told them, here are all the things I'd like you to do. And presumably, we don't know for how long, maybe it was a really long time, who knows? They were delighting in the will of God because they were able not to sin. But after the fall, after they sinned, our human will was not able not to sin. And you'll have to forgive the double negatives, but it just, it fits with the list of things we're talking here. So no longer were they able not to sin. They were not able not to sin. 
And this is what scriptures make clear. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. This is what Luther wrote about in his uh, genius work, The Bondage of the Will. There were theologians in his day that said, no, no, we, we have the ability in our, in our human uh, uh, abilities, even before God's intervention, uh, to be able to do something that pleases God. And Luther and the scriptures say, no, <laughs> we don't. We're not able to be anything except an enemy of God after the fall. However, after baptism, when it is we receive the Holy Spirit, and now we have a spirit, Allah, Romans 7, that align us with God's will, we are not able not to sin on account of our flesh, that is our old nature, that still resides with us, but simultaneously, we are able not to sin on account of the Spirit. You are able to do a good work of love and service that brings glory to God and, and glorifies your Father who is in heaven. And that is according to your new nature. Again, go back to what Paul was saying. And so we call this the simul in theology, simultaneously saint and sinner. Simul justus et peccator in Latin. You may have heard of that. We are at the same time saint and sinner, and they're happening, happening concurrently. And that's how it will be until the day we die or until Jesus comes again. And when Jesus comes again after the resurrection, now we will be, again, here's why it's important to realize that, that the flesh-spirit distinction is not the same as the body-spirit, uh, body-soul um, distinction, because when Jesus comes again, we will be raised in both body and soul, and we will be only spirit, no longer flesh. We will have a physical body, but we will not have our sinful flesh. And so we will not be able to sin because we have been redeemed at that point by Jesus. Now, before I go any further with that, any questions about that? Dean? I understand that uh, after we die, we get a new body when we're in heaven. I would want to be a little more careful with that statement, because if you're talking about heaven, the place where our soul goes to be with Christ after we die, then no, your imperishable body is not there yet. Now, what you look like in heaven, I don't know. I'll let you know when I get there. Or maybe we'll just say, hey, this is it. Um, <clears throat> but we don't receive an imperishable body that is our resurrected body until Christ comes again to earth to raise us, raise that body up imperishable. So um, I don't know what my soul looks like apart from my body. And that's also not how God intended us to be created. Um, death unnaturally separates our body and soul. And the, you know, the Bible obviously talks about heaven as a place where our soul goes. He tells the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. It talks about it as a rest from our labors, that we are in Christ's nearer presence. All these things it says about heaven, but what it looks like can't actually say. But we do know that when Christ comes to redeem this earth and redeem our bodies, then we will have that imperishable body. So does that help make sense, that a little bit? Okay. And by the way, when Jesus comes again, heaven and earth are now one. So we are both in heaven and on earth when Jesus comes to raise us from the dead. And, and Dean? Follow up. Yeah. Uh, and this may be a little off the subject, but how does that affect cremation? Yeah, I get asked that a lot, and that's a good question to ask. Um, the ancient practice of creation, that is, let's say, even in like the Roman times, was actually an act of defiance against those who believe in the resurrection. That is, you think God's going to raise this body? I'll, I'll burn it to show you that he can't. We obviously believe, well, there were lots of saints who died in fires and at sea, and God will be able to handle the resurrection, because what happens to our bodies in the earth anyway? To dust you shall return. We all turn to dust. Uh, I only bring that up to let you know that some people might still have that kind of mentality. I don't think many do. Nowadays, cremation is more so viewed, um, I would say, 
as uh, maybe an ease uh, to, to help handle their, their loved one's remains and to do so in a honoring way. So I don't think the same meaning is there. But that's why, until recently, uh, Christians would always be buried in body. And, and what that was, and what it still is, is a testament to um, our belief in the resurrection. And, and actually, our committal service, which happens graveside, and, uh, and uh, makes mention, it, actually, it's all about the resurrection. It's a, it says in our committal service, uh, may God allow these remains to rest in peace, because we know their souls in heaven, until the day when God raises that body again from the dead, and it's here in this location that they will see, as Job says, with their own eyes, their Savior face to face. So a Christian funeral, and especially the burial part, the committal part, is always a wonderful, it's our, if you think about it, it's your last testimony to others because it's not for you, it's for others, um, of your belief in the resurrection. So it's a beautiful thing. So I would encourage people to always have a burial, whether that's with a body or whether that's with cremation remains. Um, I would uh, uh, encourage not to in, do the scattering of ashes type thing. Um, I know some of you probably know people who did the scattering of ashes. And so I'm here to tell you that again, God can handle it on the day of the resurrection. You know, it's not a mortal sin or anything like that. But as we're thinking about our own burial, think of it this way. This is my last um, witness on this earth to my belief in the resurrection. So I would like to bury my remains or put them in a, what do they call those columbariums? Or, you know, here's the place where my body will rest until Jesus raises it. So even if you um, have been cremated, because we plan to do that, it's a lot less expensive. <laughs> we are going to do that. The imper and since it's an imperishable body anyway, the imperishable body will raise from the ashes. And we were going to scatter. I'll think twice about it now. I was going to have them scatter me in the St. Mary's River. So, yeah. Okay, so... Um, but they'll they'll come together and become so, an imperishable. Yes. So by the way, this is a very this can be a very personal decision. So come talk to me about it. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But yeah, just uh, generally speaking, I would encourage against scattering of ashes and actually look for a pastor uh, to conduct a burial for you. And it's a beautiful thing. I I just had a quick question. Yeah. So you hear about rapture and all of that stuff. And yeah. This might be off the subject too much. That's okay. Um, Matt was afraid I would tell everybody that he wanted his ashes to go up in a fireworks shop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was afraid I would Hats share. out of the bag. <laughs> yeah, he was afraid I would share that. But, oh, um, good thing you didn't then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, the, the rapture thing you hear about that. Yeah. Um, so, so your question is, how does the rapture, yeah. So that is a big topic, um, and we're we're just there. But I don't want to leave the question hanging. So I'll try in our remaining minute here. I'll try to address that. Um, the rapture belongs within a theology called dispensational premillennialism, and that's a big fancy word saying that at the end of time there's going to be a whole bunch of things happening, various stages according to how they read Revelation. One of which will be Jesus coming kind of secretly and taking believers away, leaving all unbelievers left on earth. Just to put it simply, as Lutherans, we don't believe that. Uh, we are amillennialist, which means that as we interpret scripture, uh, we think it, the scripture is very clear, and I'll give you the passages if you come ask me for them, that indicate that the millennium is happening right now. We are in the end times, Christ is reigning. He's not coming to set up a different kind of earthly reign. Christ is reigning, and it's through his church. And he has commissioned his church to share the gospel until the day he comes again, when all eyes will see and all ears will hear and all knees will bow. So there isn't sort of a secret first coming and then a later second coming. It's going to be one last day. And um, at that day, as Revelation says, all people, both Christians and non-Christians alike, will be raised but some will be sent to hell and, and others will be welcomed into eternal life. There's no second chance. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is the thousand years. So their chances right now, which emphasizes our mission, doesn't it? All right, so th does that help? I, I, that was like breezing through what could be several weeks of study, but hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> All right. All right, so I thought that we would um, be finishing that up, uh, the introduction today, which we did. So hooray. Um, next week, we have our uh, first foray into the book of Galatians. You'll say, thank goodness, we're actually going to read the book that we're studying. Um, but hopefully that was helpful to you. And if you want next week's handout early, I have it. If you'd rather just wait till next week so you don't lose it, you can wait till next week. I'll have it out on the tables. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, as the bell rings, we are reminded uh, that uh, you are the God of grace and mercy, and you have given us your son, Jesus Christ, so that our conscience need not be afflicted. Of course, at times it is, and so we confess to you our weakness and help us in faith by your Holy Spirit to always turn to the good news of Jesus Christ. And now as we live as, as people of the Spirit, that we would share that good news with others as we go. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Is that